I ask unanimous consent that I be permitted to speak as if in morning business for a period of about 10 minutes. Is, is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me begin by, by thanking my uh, dear friend from the state of Arizona for pointing out to us once again and reminding us of this egregious practice of earmark spending that continues to not only uh, grow, but who continues to be uh, uh, really, I think, a dark mark on our record here as members of the United States Congress. And I think, as he rightly pointed out, at a time of serious economic distress in places like Arizona, and I certainly could say us in Florida, that it is uh, a bit uh, out of sync for us to be continuing the spending as usual just by the mere fact that there is a member of the Appropriations Committee that can, in fact, command uh, something uh, to be done only because it will benefit a narrow interest within their state, within their district, which in fact may not have been requested and may not be needed. Um, Mr. President, I rise though to speak about the events in Honduras. Uh, Hondurans are the unfortunate result, the, the events that are taking place in Honduras right now are the unfortunate result of a silence from both the United States and the inter-American community to the sustained assault of Honduras democratic institutions. It is difficult for Honduras, Hondurans, and other proponents of democracy within the region to understand the full significance of President Zelaya's expulsion from Honduras. Up until this point, there has not been any significant voice or action in opposition to the dismantling of democratic institutions and free societies in Venezuela, Bolivia, and as Honduras was going down the path, you might also add Nicaragua to that to name only of the, a few of the most visible cases. It is also hard to explain why there was silence in the face of President Zelaya's earlier con unconstitutional actions, especially the events that appears to have precipitated his ousting, the storming of a military base to seize and distribute ballots for a referendum that previously had been declared unconstitutional by the Honduran Supreme Court. A fundamental tenet of democracy is the separation of powers. You've got a president in the executive branch, and then you have a, a judicial branch of government, a co-equal and separate branch, and that branch of government told the president that the referendum he was seeking to have to extend his rule beyond the constitutional term was illegal, should not be done. He was undeterred, and he was completely unrepentant as he sought to continue with his plan to have a referendum, even though the Congress, even though the judiciary had already told him that that was in contravention of the Constitution of their country. Where was the region's outrage over Hugo Chavez's support for Mr. Celaya's unconstitutional actions in Honduras? Mr. Chavez supported Mr. Celaya because they're kindred spirits, because Mr. Chavez already had been able to usurp every institution of democracy within his country of Venezuela and now rules as an autocrat, he wanted to have that same playbook be applied to Honduras as he has coached and shepherded the doings of the same thing in Bolivia and to some degree in Ecuador as well and Nicaragua now coming along. So the Honduran people decided that this was not going to happen in their country and the people in the Honduran Congress and in the Honduran Supreme Court decided that it was not going to happen on their watch. But the region's silence toward the assault on democracy in Honduras followed a pattern of acquiescence of Chavez's dismantling of democratic institutions and civil liberties in Venezuela. For instance, the OAS has said absolutely nothing about Chavez's closing of independent media, his manipulation of elections, his erosion of independent branches of government, and his usurping of the authority of local elected officials. Leaders like Chavez, Ortega, and Celaya have cloaked themselves in the language of democracy when it's convenient for them, yet their actions ignore it when it doesn't further their personal ambitions. This situation was compounded by the United States' actions, including work behind the scenes to keep the Honduran Congress and Supreme Court from using the clearly legal means of presidential impeachment. Some of us have wondered, why wasn't he impeached? Why didn't the Congress go ahead and impeach President Zelaya? The fact of the matter is that our embassy in, 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 in Tegucigalpa counseled that we should not do that, that they should not do that, that the Hondurans should not use the tools of impeachment. 
Having stood on the sidelines while Mr. Salaya overstepped his nation's constitution, the United States and the inter-American community only speak now. Protecting a sitting president, regardless of their illegal act, sex a dangerous president. Instead, U.S. policy should be focused on supporting efforts that uphold the integrity of constitutional order and democratic institutions. In fairness to the Obama administration, this distorted policy is not new. Through advice from the State Department, former President George W. Bush was talked out of having the United States stand visibly with democratic advocates in Latin America. The advice was based on the belief that by not making the United States an issue, this would allow the region to stand up for democratic activists. Unfortunately, no country or leader did so. And most significant of all, the Secretary General of the Organizations of American States has sat idly by year after year, democracy after democracy being dismantled one piece at a time, one election at a time, one institution at a time, saying absolutely nothing. The OAS has a responsibility to condemn and sanction presidential abuses, not just abuses against presidents. Because the OAS failure to uphold the checks and balances within democracies, it has become an enabler of authoritarian leaders throughout the region. The result of this has been a signal of acceptance to anti-democratic actions and abandonment of those fighting for democracy in Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador, and elsewhere. This silence was compounded by recent repudiation of the application of the Inter-American Charter, Democratic Charter, to the Cuban dictatorship. Ironically, it was in Honduras with Mr. Salaya taking the leading role where the OAS General Assembly decided against any clear democratic standards for Cuba retaking his seat in that organization. So here's what occurred. The Organization of American States, filled with a desire to reincorporate Cuba into the family of nations, completely ignoring that for 50 years, Cuba has been a military dictatorship without even the vestiges of a free and fair election. And they invited Cuba to be readmitted without setting up a standard by which they would have to leave, live. President Zelaya, with his partner Hugo Chavez, was leading the charge in saying Cuba should be welcomed back and there should be no conditions. Those conditions of democratic rule are the very ones that he is now relying upon to try to get his presidency back. It was Mr. Zelaya now seeking the very protection of the democratic charter of the OAS, which he thinks is important to apply to him, but which he felt was unimportant to apply to the rights and opportunities of the Cuban people to try to claim a democratic future for themselves. The crisis in Honduras stems from the failure of its leaders to live within constitutional boundaries and from the earlier silence of the United States and the international community regarding the abuse of power by the Honduran executive. Tragic, tragically, the United States and the OAS have put Honduras in, and the region in a position where democracy is the loser once again. The return of Mr. Salaya will signal the approval of his unconstitutional act. If he's not allowed to return, then the unacceptable behavior of forcibly exiling a leader elected by the people would be given tacit approval. This is what happens when principles are sacrificed for a policy that can only be described as the appeasement of authoritarians. In the current crisis, neither the United States nor other countries in the region or the international community should be taking sides in a constitutional dispute, but rather encouraging a resolution through dialogue among Hondurans. To this end, efforts should be focused on helping Hondurans form a reconciliation government that would include representatives not associated with either Salaya's administration or the current interim government. The objective would be to keep Honduras on track to hold currently scheduled presidential elections in November with the inauguration of a new president in January as mandated by the Honduran Constitution. The newly elected president with an electoral mandate then can decide whether and how to deal with Mr. Salaya and those involved in his ouster. As the United Senate takes up President Obama's nominee for key State Department positions in Latin America, it is time to question the acceptance by the United States and the inter-American community of the sustained dismantling of democratic institutions and free societies by presidents seeking to consolidate personal power at any cost. This is the larger challenge in Latin America, and Honduras is the latest symptom. The United States must no longer remain silent when democratic institutions are undermined. Any disruption 
of the constitutional order is unacceptable regardless of who commits it. It, it would be well for us to remember that as we look forward to what may come next, the presidential succession ought to be honored. However, institutions of democracy also ought to be equally honored. Pres uh, Secretary of State Clinton met today at 1 o'clock with deposed President Celaya. And uh, it appears that she is seeking the, uh, to align the United States with the mediation that is about to be undertaken by uh, President Oscar Arias, a Nobel Prize winning, well-regarded man from Costa Rica. And that President Arias might be, uh, uh, take the opportunity to see how we can bring this process back together again. Seems to me that the elections in Honduras ought to take place as scheduled and a new democratically elected government ought to go forward. The real question is, will Mr. Celaya be allowed to return to the office of president? It seems to be fairly unanimous that all Honduran inst institutions oppose such an outcome. They do not want Mr. Celaya back. They have seen the dark movie of what life can be like in a Cuba-type situation. They have seen the erosion of democracy with the complete erosion of freedoms, uh, so much uh, uh, made a dear part of what we in this country believe in that has taken place in Venezuela. They've seen the continued erosion of democratic values in Nicaragua. They don't want to see it happen in their country, and one can't blame them. It would only be fitting that they should find uh, comfort by those of us in this country who uh, not only value democracy for us, but believe that it should be shared by others around the world no matter their circumstances. It isn't good enough to be elected democratically but then rule as a dictator, and in the process of being an elected president, then move to erode all the institutions of democracy, the courts, the Congresses, uh, even the military as an institution, ought to be respected, their independence ought to be valued, and what uh, the playbook of Mr. Chavez, which is to uh, dismantle the military leadership and bring in cronies of his like, uh, the efforts to then uh, discredit the courts and bring in judges that he would also approve of. Uh, and this has been the playbook by which uh, Chavez has operated and the one that Mr. Celaya was attempting to put into play. So let's hope that President Arias in Costa, from Costa Rica will be able to lead a mediation effort that will bring together all the disparate groups, that there can be a free and fair election, and that there can be a resolution to this crisis of democracy. But let it also be a wake-up call to the rest of us who have been silently by as this erosion of democracy takes place one country at a time in Latin America. We ought to say enough is enough. Let's stand for the rule of law. Let's stand for democracy, not only on election day, but each and every day thereafter, as we seek leaders that not only are elected democratically, but governed democratically. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Arizona. Mr. President, I just wanted to compliment my colleague from Florida for a very uh, thorough explanation of what has been to many Americans a very confusing situation and uh, also his support for the most recent call for a mediation uh, and uh, discussion among the various parties so that this whole matter can be brought to a successful co conclusion without armed force or uh, other inappropriate action. And I too hope that that can uh, produce the right kind of result. But I think the point, and if I could just, uh, 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 while the Senator is still here, uh, make this point, strongly as he did. You have to stand up for what's right. And we all know that a demo a, an election does not a democracy make. You can elect a government which then begins to govern undemocratically. And unfortunately, some of the governments uh, in the southern part of our hemisphere have started out all right with elections and then ended up in a very, very bad way. We certainly didn't want that to happen to our friends in Honduras. And in fact, the people of Honduras didn't want that either. There are people who stood by us when we were trying to support uh, the forces of freedom who were fighting in Nicaragua. And uh, there was some sacrifice on the part of the Hondurans to do that. Um, and it is a country that has been had very friendly re relations with the United States over the years. And it is important for us to stand up for our friends. And for that, I compliment my colleague from Florida. And, and um, again, 
uh, add my voice to, to his, saying that we hope that these discussions that the Secretary of State has now called for uh, can produce an appropriate resolution to this issue without uh, uh, any kind of bloodshed or violence. I want to thank the Senator from Arizona for the kind comments, but I also uh, brings up an important point. Honduras has been by our side, and there is no more important country in terms of military relations in Central America than Honduras, where we have a, a presence of our military, where we work together in partnership to try to stem the flow of drugs and narcotics into our country, and where we conduct not only training missions, but other important activities with the Honduran military as a partner and where we are very involved in providing aid and assistance. I think it would be, it would be well for us to hold back any uh, declaration that a coup has taken place, which would then trigger other events. This is not your traditional military coup where a military group decides to set up a junta. These uh, military people, while maybe acted a little too strongly, the fact of the matter is they didn't seek power for themselves, but they established a constitutional order of succession. And so anyway, an important... Mr. President, I, I, that's precisely.